All right, hello everyone. Um, welcome, my name is Elizabeth Ponce. I'm the visual, I'm sorry, I'm the public programs coordinator for the List Visual Arts Center. I'm really happy to be joined by Taylor Michael Bailey, um, a doctoral student from the Department of History, Anthropology, and Science, Technology, and Society. A long one. Um, so as some of you may be familiar, this series of grad talks gives us the opportunity to look at our gallery exhibitions through a new lens as graduate students share their research with us um, and just provide a new perspective on how that connects to the visual arts that we have in our galleries. Um, so Taylor is an environmental historian of the US and as I mentioned, a PhD candidate here at MIT. His research examines the history of efforts to actively restore wildlife species in the US and how these practices have changed over time and the consequences of historical conservation projects. So tonight, we'll, Taylor will share more of his research and um, it will relate to Alan Michelson's Wolf Nation, which is on view behind us, muted, but behind us. Um, so without further ado, welcome Taylor. Thank you so much. So it's a pleasure to be here this evening. Um, and before I start, I really want to thank Elizabeth um, Ponce and the List uh, Visual Arts Center here at MIT for giving me a chance to uh, talk a little bit about my research um, and how it relates to the Symbionts exhibit that's going on right now. So as Elizabeth said, my name is Taylor Bailey. Um, I'm a doctoral candidate uh, here at MIT in the program in uh, History, Anthropology, and Science and Technology and Society. That is a mouthful, um, I know. Uh, and my work centers on the environmental and animal history of the United States um, in the 19th and 20th centuries predominantly um, with a focus on the history of wildlife uh, management and conservation. So I'm currently deep in the midst of the uh, archival research process. Uh, so I feel fortunate to have the opportunity to peek out from behind the books and the PDF files and the archive photos um, and the documents to kind of get my bearings, so to speak, and by kind of chatting with you today about my dissertation topic and how it relates to the exhibit. So playing on the wall behind me um, is a piece by the Mohawk artist Alan Michelson titled Wolf Nation. Uh, using critter cam footage of a pack of critically endangered uh, red wolves living at the Wolf Conservation Center uh, in South Salem, New York, and overlaid with a purple stain, uh, Michelson evokes a wampum belt in digital form. For the Munsee uh, Lenape people, also known as the Wolf Clan, the traditional inhabitants of what is now, what now encompasses uh, parts of the states of New York, Pennsylvania, and Delaware, wampum belts constructed from purple and white uh, shell beads are living documents that signal urgency, used to seal uh, agreements and even declare war. In the words of the List Center's placard uh, for the piece, Michelson's Wolf Nation transforms video surveillance technology into a filmic meditation that relates the present day eradication of the red wolf to the massacre and violent displacement of the Lenape Muncie people. The film, which totals about nine minutes long, features an accompanying track of wolf vocalizations uh, created by the White Mountain Apache artist Laura Ortman. Uh, and for obvious reasons, uh, we don't have that track playing right now. In Wolf Nation, uh, Michelson draws an explicit connection between the Muncie Lenape people and the endangered red wolf, a species of North American wolf uh, that historically ranged um, throughout the southeast, uh, southeastern United States, uh, as far west as Texas and Oklahoma, and as far north as southern New York. Both the Munsee and the Red Wolf were driven off their land uh, through the often violent processes of European uh, settler colonization. In the mid-1970s, uh, a small population of just 17 Red Wolves living along the coast of Texas and Louisiana uh, were captured uh, by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and captive breeding programs were initiated. Today, red wolves are present in about 45 uh, captive breeding facilities nationwide and about 240 of the wolves remain. A very small uh, so-called experimental population uh, of 15 to 17 wolves, uh, wild red wolves, uh, currently reside in a handful of wildlife refuges um, along the, east, the coast of eastern North Carolina. But other than that, 
red wolves are considered by wildlife biologists today to be extinct in the wild. The red wolves featured in Michelson's Wolf Nation are just one species in a longer list of North American carnivores targeted for eradication over the past four centuries or so. As white settlers pushed westward, clearing forested land for timber and agricultural development, large carnivorous mammals like wolves, mountain lions, uh, bobcats, and bears lost much of their habitat across their geographic ranges. They were also heavily persecuted. The Massachusetts Bay Colony, for example, imposed the first bounty in North America in 1630, offering one shilling to any colonist who killed a wolf. By the turn of the 20th century, as cattle ranching and wool growing expanded across the American West, and as ranchers' fears of livestock depredations swelled, predator control evolved from a practice commonly undertaken by local people, often trappers killing varmints, uh, in return for bounties, to a systematic federal and state, federal and state level programs carried out by full-time bureaucratic professionals armed with deadly industrial tools. Alongside steel leg traps and shooting, the method of choice often involved lacing baits or animal carcasses with strychnine poison, which caused the afflicted animals to experience muscle convulsions and asphyxiate. From the 1910s to the 1930s, predator control agents from the U.S. Bureau of Biological Survey, the precursor agency to the Fish and Wildlife Service, was killing tens of thousands of coyotes, wolves, mountain lions, and bobcats each, bobcats each year, uh, chiefly in the interest of protecting livestock. In most cases, the aim was total eradication. Although some critics within the scientific community uh, began to voice concerns about the biological effects of predator control programs in the interwar years uh, between World War I and World War II, uh, the removal of so-called vermin was largely unquestioned. From a political and practical standpoint, uh, carnivore eradication was simply considered to be, in the words of uh, the historian Frank Van Nuys, sound conservation policy. If carnivore species uh, were reduced or eliminated from, a, from the land, beneficial species would thrive, or so the prevailing logic held. My own research tracks the development of a parallel line of thought within the broader movement uh, for wildlife conservation that took shape around the same period as the push for intensified predator control measures uh, at the turn of the 20th century. At the time, the term wildlife was still a rarely used hyphenated word, and the political movement that we would now understand as wildlife conservation was called game protection. Broadly speaking, wild animals were uh, generally separated into three categories, non, or, uh, game, non-game, and vermin or pests. While the delineations were porous at times, uh, black bears, for example, could, depending on the time and place, be considered both game and vermin, uh, within federal and state wildlife policy, these distinctions persisted well into the late 20th century. At the helm of this game protection movement uh, were white sport hunters, many of whom came from elite East Coast backgrounds such as Theodore Roosevelt and George Bird Grinnell, who formed the Boone and Crockett Club in 1887. In the face of widespread declines in popular game species like deer, elk, wild turkey, and waterfowl, Game protectionists lobbied state governments to establish fish and game commissions with the authority to regulate hunting, impose license requirements and limits on the number of animals that hunters could shoot, and to enforce game laws um, in areas uh, by hiring wardens and game protectors. Game protectionists also sought to pre preserve areas of land in the form of refuges, uh, which were off limits to hunting. President Theodore Roosevelt uh, created the first federal wildlife refuge, uh, Pelican Island Wildlife Refuge on the Atlantic coast of Florida by executive order in 1903. By the early 1900s, however, a small group of sportsman conservationists looking to distinguish themselves from the regulatory and law enforcement approaches of game protectionists began to promote captive breeding and animal translocations as solutions to wildlife declines. 
My dissertation begins with this push for game restoration in the 1910s. As the environmental historian Laura Martin has recently argued in her book Wild by Design, restorationists sought to, see, sought to achieve an abundance of game animals through the manipulation of animal bodies rather than the manipulation of laws and regulations. In doing so, they offered an explicit alternative to the protectionist, protectionist measures, which restorationists believed had failed to produce any returns. Their motivations often combined aesthetic, scientific, and economic concerns. Uh, some organizations were directed towards saving charismatic species from extinction, like the American Bison Society, while others concentrated on expanding shooting opportunities for recreational hunters, like the game, American Game Protective Association, which was founded in 1911, which lobbied, uh, among other things, for the creation of game farms, largely based on European models, um, and the, as well as the introduction of non-native uh, fauna, such as the Chinese ring-necked pheasant uh, and the Hungarian partridge. My own preliminary research suggests that these early game restorationists also made significant attempts to scientize wildlife conservation in the early 20th century through the creation of experimental research stations, private training schools, and university programs in game breeding. Rather than turning to biology, members of this more game movement an initiative spearheaded by sport hunters and concerned firearm and ammunitions companies in the 1910s, they looked to agricultural science as a way to apply the progressive era principles of efficiency and rational management to the conservation of game. Primarily focused on game birds and waterfowl, more game advocates sought to combine traditional European gamekeeping methods with research in poultry science to reliably propagate both native and exotic species, like the introduced ring-neck pheasant um, on large farms that could restock depleted areas uh, and thus provide greater opportunities for hunting. So my interest in this topic uh, came from my own experiences growing up um, in southwestern Ohio. As a kid, I spent quite a bit of time um, outside in the woods uh, the patches of kind of woodland surrounding my suburban home, and evidence of white-tailed deer was everywhere. Um, I was shocked to find out, through the process of this research, that white-tailed deer had been declared extinct in Ohio in 1904. In his influential 1913 book, Our Vanishing Wildlife, the vocal conservationist William Temple Hornaday declared Ohio to be, quote, the nearest of all the states to being gameless. Presently, estimates of Ohio deer population are close to one million. How did this happen? So as it turns out, the, res the return of the white-tailed deer to Ohio and other states, for that matter, was not simply the result of natural increase, but rather the consequence of ambitious restoration programs taking place on a national scale. In Ohio, the Fish and Game Department restocked the state using deer acquired from Illinois, Pennsylvania, and various private and state game preserves. In other states, sources of deer came from much longer lists of locations. Virginia, for example, received deer from 11 different states. In total, 30 states participated in restoration programs like these for white-tailed deer. Given the extent of, the acti of activities pursued by 20th century wildlife conservationists, it does not seem outlandish to suggest, I think, that the restoration eff efforts, that these restoration efforts initiated biological changes, particularly among large North American vertebrates, on a scale not seen since the Columbian Exchange. Wildlife managers trapped some species, like white-tailed deer and wild turkey, in places where they were plentiful and relocated them uh, to areas where they were scarce or had been regionally extirpated. These historical rearrangements, is what I'm calling them, of uh, regionally distinct subspecies are detectable now at the genetic level in present day animals. Conservationists uh, introduced other species, other species like the Eastern Cottontail Rabbit uh, in, uh, to the state of Oregon uh, in the 1950s. Uh, the Mountain Goat was introduced to Olympic National Park um, and where it had supposedly never existed before. 
um, and even a giant subspecies of Canada goose, uh, some of which are probably hanging out uh, by the Charles right now, um, to locations that are well outside their presumed pre-European contact historic ranges. And as I mentioned before, managers also made attempts to acclimatize numerous non-native game species, some of which, like pheasants and partridges, uh, still comprise a significant part of state wildlife departments' operations uh, on game farms today. Massachusetts is one of the states that stocks pheasants, uh, for example. So there's two final points that I'd like to make. Um, the first is that this transitional period that I've identified uh, from a largely protectionist wildlife conservation philosophy to an active restoration-oriented movement gave rise in the 1920s and uh, 1930s to the profession of wildlife management. Traditionally, historians have uh, attributed the ideological roots of wildlife management to uh, the growing influence of the science of ecology, which was also getting its start around the same period. My research points to a much more varied origin story. While ecological principles significantly influenced the work of the field's central founder, uh, the Wisconsin biologist and forester Aldo Leopold, the wildlife management field as a whole appears to have derived uh, concepts um, from agricultural science, animal husbandry, scientific management, forestry, fisheries science, and European game breeding. Reading government reports, um, it's hard to miss the agronomic language that's embedded in the profession. Uh, from the 1930s onward, wildlife managers consistently referred to game animals as crops, seed stock, that could be increased by manipulating environmental factors to ensure an abundant harvest for hunters. The historian Christian C. Young has also pointed out that the concept of carrying capacity uh, was derived not from ecologists, but from range management specialists, who coined the term in the late 1890s to indicate the number of grazing animals that a given plot of land uh, could sustainably support. Certainly, ecological research into the habitat requirements of certain species, as well as predator and prey relationships, uh, played an important role in the development of the profession. But it was by no, by no means the only source of inspiration for the field's practices. The second point I'll make um, concerns the role of recreational hunters in wildlife conservation policy. Uh, sport hunters had been central to the game protection movement of the late 19th and early 20th century. But over the course of that period, hunting became more democratized. As the United States became increasingly urban, Hunting transformed from a predominantly recreational pursuit um, that involved uh, a much wider range of people. In other, in other words, sport hunting was no longer the domain of the wealthy and the elite. As such, hunting organizations and firearm and ammuni ammunition companies, with an interest in increasing the availability of game, played, came to play an outsized role in determining conservation policy. Industry-funded groups like the Sporting Arms and Ammunition Manufacturers Institute and the Wildlife Management Institute, for example, uh, not only funded research in game breeding and wildlife management, but lobbied Congress for the creation of new laws that would further strengthen the links uh, between wildlife bureaucracy and sport hunting. Revenues from the sale of hunting licenses uh, already contributed uh, the bulk of the funding for state fish and game agencies' uh, operations. But in 1934, Congress effectively federalized this process, passing the Migratory Bird Hunting Stamp Act, which required all waterfowl hunters to annually purchase a $1 duck stamp on top of state license fees to finance the creation, development, and operation of a national system of waterfowl refuges, which were often termed duck factories. Argu arguably the most significant piece of legislation, however, was the Federal Aid in Wildlife Restoration, or Pittman-Robertson Act of 1937, which provided matching grants to the state wildlife agencies for restoration work by redirecting funds from an already existing 10% federal excise tax on the sale of firearms, cartridges, and shells. Drafted by Carl Shoemaker of the American Wildlife Institute, 
the Pittman-Robertson Pittman Bill, or PR as it was called, received the full endorsement of the arms of arms in industry executives. The maximum amount of, a, maximum amount of money that a state uh, agency could receive was determined by a proportion of the state's total land area and the number of licensed hunters in the state. To alleviate the problem of state governments appropriating hunter license fees for other purposes, Pittman Robertson Act required each state to pass an enabling act um, prohibiting the use of so-called sportsman's money for anything other than the administration of the state fish and game department. It was common uh, for a lot of state legislatures to tap into uh, the budget of the Fish and Wildlife Agency um, when times were tough, and this was passed during the Great Depression, so that makes sense. Once an enabling act was passed, uh, states could receive up to 75% of a restoration project's cost um, after the Secretary of Agriculture uh, approved the proposal. This law is still in place today, and, many, and for many states, uh, upwards of 40% of the state wildlife agency's budget is derived from PR funds. Not surprisingly, the PR program um, has almost exclusively benefited the species of game that hunters desired. So to conclude, I'd like to uh, return to Alan Michelson, Al Michelson's uh, Wolf Nation. Um, in an essay produced for the piece's debut at the, Wil the Whitney Museum of American Art in New York City, curator, curator Clem Clemens White writes, quote, although the Wolf Conservation Center undertakes essential work to restore the wolves to their wild homes, those that we see in Wolf Nation are, mon in, are in a monitored enclosure. Such paradoxes resonate throughout Michelson's work. And in order, in order to survive, the wolves are held in captivity by the very system that has left them on the brink of extinction. Juxtaposed with the clear preference for some species over others, in the history of wildlife conservation and management, the presumed incompatibility of humans and large carnivores is all the more striking. Socially, politically, culturally, we've made the decision to live with the dangers that come with coexisting with overabundant deer, for example. Hundreds of fatalities and thousands of injuries as a result of deer-related automobile accidents, for example, occur each year but not with wolves or mountain lions, which statistically injure far less people. Our present day circumstances um, are the result of historical choices. And we have the opportunity, I think, to rethink some of those decisions. So that's where I end. Thank you. Thank you, Taylor, for speaking with us tonight, and thank you guys for joining us for his talk. Um, for those of you who walked around the exhibition, you know that there's a lot to unpack in Symbionts, so how lucky are we to have a million experts in every field on MIT's campus to uh, give us some perspective on the work.